see all of you. Thank you for being here for this incredible panel. Um, I think you are sure to learn a thing or two. Um, and I would really like to thank our panelists, Denise. Well, Denise is moderating, but she's also part of the, the panel. Um, Josiah, Kat Cassandra, and Representative Monique Priestley for participating today. <laughs> Um, when I first met with this panel, they helped me diffuse my own fears about AI, and it also sparked my curiosity. So, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Denise. Oh, and I will remind you that right after this, we will be drawing two names for the raffle. If you haven't entered, you can do that over there. Thank you. Denise, take it away. I will do it. I'll do it happily. Hi, I'm Denise Shakurjan, and it's my pure pleasure to be your moderator today. Um, you're in expert hands here. You're going to learn a lot. Um, I imagine your heads are bursting from all that you've learned today. So I'll try to simplify things by letting you know how it's gonna go here. Um, first, I'd like a bit of a show of hands. We're here to talk about generative AI. We'll get into what that means soon. But I'm wondering, how many of you have played around with some of these tools like chat, GPT. Okay, good, great. Okay, so maybe about a, a third or so. All right, good, um, that helps us uh, figure out the lay of the land. Well, the way we set this up today is we're all going to give a quick introduction of ourselves. Josiah is gonna take it over with a demo of some of these tools in action so that you all see kind of what we're talking about. We'll move into some um, questions and answers. I'll be sure to save a good solid 15 minutes at the end for your questions. And then uh, the panelists will leave you with kind of a parting thought that you, you might want to think about on the way out. Um, it's a lot to cover, but I think we're going to have a lot of fun with it today. Honestly, introducing people to these tools is my idea of fun these days. I'm not sure what it says about my life, but <laughs> it's certainly a true statement. I'm Denise Shakurjan. Um, I'm a, a lawyer, I'm a writer, um, I'm a co-founder of a library, a makerspace generator in Burlington, and most, and most recently, um, a nonprofit called AI Vermont. Um, I'm also a mother, two young men, one of whom works in this field, which is how I got interested in it. Um, so interested in it that uh, I helped set up this new foundation and um, we have an event coming up I just want to put on your radar especially for the educators in the room of any stripe secondary educators school administrators uh, we are running an event uh, later this month June 27th at Hula in Burlington and it's an opportunity for teachers to actually get their hands on some of these tools, interact, learn the skills, lots of fun, student panel. And the other piece of that is toward the end of that day, we're doing a keynote that we are opening to the community at large, anybody. And that is uh, Casey Mock from Center uh, for Humane Technologies. Casey works with Monique here, as you may hear. Um, these are the folks that brought us the movie, The Social Network, you guys remember that? and the AI dilemma, and Casey will be addressing the flip side after a full day of being acquainted with all the spectacular possibilities, Casey will be pointing out the ethics and the regulation and the safety concerns. And I'm gonna stand up and do a rebuttal if I know myself. So, <laughs> there it is, that's me. So, Monique, take it away. Hi, uh, Monique Priestley. Um, so my background uh, is mostly in uh, tech, anything from database design and web development, um, uh, doing hardwiring of things, um, and uh, most recently I spent 14 years working for an ed tech company in Seattle, um, and I have a um, background uh, education-wise in digital media. Um, communications, um, and then in Bradford, I started a, I turned a retail store that had been abandoned into a co-working, non-profit co-working space um, that teaches uh, STEM programming, creative economy, entrepreneurship, um, and civic engagement. Um, and uh, I most recently, I just ended, or I guess I'm still in <laughs> my uh, first term as a legislator um, in the House of Rep for 
uh, Vermont. Um, I'm on the House Commerce Committee, um, and my focus uh, has been uh, future work bills, entrepreneurship, artificial intelligence, and data privacy, kind of all of that uh, realm. Um, and so worked with Casey on one of the AI bills, um, and I'm trying to <laughs> get a data privacy bill passed. Um, and if that passes, the next step is really trying to uh, get into AI regulations. Thank you. Yes? Yeah. Uh, great, great to be here with you all, Cass Madison. I wear a couple different hats. Um, I am VP of Partnerships at an organization called the Tech Talent Project, and we do national work focused on helping uh, public institutions and nonprofit and government get better at recruiting, retaining, and empowering technologists, and then going out and trying to find amazing technologists and uh, inspiring them to leave their high-paying Silicon Valley jobs to go do public service work. So I'm so excited that there's technologists in our legislature. Um, so that's thing one. Thing two is uh, launch COO for an organization called the Center for Public Sector AI. Again, a little bit more of a national focus, but what we're trying to do is equip health and human services leaders in government with the tools, knowledge, and expertise they need to make good decisions about how to apply how, when, where to apply AI technologies to benefit delivery for vulnerable populations. Um, before doing all of that, I spent about seven and a half years working for our state Medicaid agency. I'm not a technologist, I'm a policy person by training, but ended up having a front row seat to a bunch of different technology rollout disasters, challenges, depending on how you want to characterize them. Um, and it's really become my passion to help our, our public institutions like roll out technology in a way that helps people. Uh, so spend a lot of, I spend a lot of time thinking about workforce, skills training, things like that. I'm excited to be a part of this panel today. And I'm Josiah Raish. I'm the state's chief data and AI officer. Vermont was the first state to have kind of a, a senior director level position on artificial intelligence. Um, and so I did that role for about a year and a half and then uh, we've just combined the data and AI offices and I've become the chief data and AI officer. Uh, so what I get to work on is super fun. I get to do uh, both kind of the implementation like technical side but then also um, helping out with policy making within the executive branch. So um, Vermont is among the farthest ahead states on AI policy and use within state government and we have a number of uh, very large prominent states who are you know reaching out to us and finding out how we're how we're doing AI here in Vermont and um, and copying a lot of times verbatim uh, our work so that's really cool and exciting and great to be on the forefront in front of that that's really cool all of you guys we are definitely in the presence of experts um, so Josiah before we get any further why don't we take a little look at what we're talking about here sure so uh, one of the challenges with talking about AI is the definition keeps changing if we were having this conversation five years ago, we would be talking about like a very different set of tech. Uh, but while the the how the tech is implemented changes over time, the ability of computers to do things that we would normally think only people could do is kind of the through line there. So um, right now we're going to be talking about generative AI, which is a little uh, it's focused on creating uh, mostly like images and word content. Um, and we'll, we'll dive into what that looks like here in just a second. Um, I think as you're considering how AI works, there's a lot of uh, discussion about, you know, is it, uh, is it alive, is it, is it sentient, things like that. And I think at this point, the AI tools we have are good at two tasks, but they're really good at them. One is putting things into, right, into the right bucket, so classifying uh, information that you give the tool and figuring out what type of information it is. And then the other one is predicting what comes next. So when you use a tool like ChatGPT, it's first looking at the input that you give it, figuring out what you likely want to do with that, that's the classification step, and then predicting uh, you know, uh, words and then eventually like paragraphs and pages and maybe reams of material uh, based, on, based on what you've provided it. Um, so I, I want to like dive into what this looks like. So I've got... Uh, ChatGPT up, and if you uh, haven't used ChatGPT before, um, it's it's a chat interface. You're chatting with a robot. It's fun. Uh, if you've used this tool before, uh, this will be familiar. But I'm using Omni, which I actually hadn't used until like this week. And no, I gotta get mine gone. yeah, it's it's pretty yeah. great. So uh, here, I'm gonna give this to Cass, and uh, I'm gonna type. Hold it for you. Yeah, you, so you can talk. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here we go. So 
uh, my boss asked me to work on promotional materials for the Vermont Women's yeah, okay. <laughs> Opportunity Conference. What kinds of materials should I be getting together? And you get, all get to watch me type in real time, which is always dangerous. All right, so. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna need to do both. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe. So now, now that it's talking, I or, or putting stuff out, I can I can talk. So. Um, all right. So I, the prompt I used was uh, my boss asked me to get promotional materials together for this conference. What th types of things should I be getting together? And ChatGPT has come back with with some ideas. So one is uh, you should think about event branding, a logo, some sort of color schemes. You should think about printed material, flyers, brochures, an event program, digital materials. And I don't know how well you can see up there. It's pretty big. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and pro promotional content. We should do blog posts. Okay. We should do some giveaways. I think I heard there's going to be some giveaways. ChatGPT has a lot of good ideas. Uh, we got signage. We've got interactive stuff. All right. Follow-up materials. All right. So these are good. Uh, but these are kind of generic. So here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do another prompt. And I'm going to say that I want to target uh, folks who are in career transition or who are entrepreneurs. And while he's typing, I'll just jump in and say that prompt is pretty critical to getting the most out of these tools. There's a whole new discipline coming up now called prompt engineering. The more context you give the machine, the more it's able to respond to you. Um, and let's remember, these are machines. You don't like what you hear, you fix your prompt. Uh, you want it uh, more sophisticated, uh, sim more simplistic, fix your prompt and it'll come right back, lickety split, as you see. Okay, so reaching the, the particular group of folks who, who uh, we'd want to reach out to uh, for this event, it suggests using online communities and forums, okay? Uh, Reddit, Facebook groups, all right, uh, social media marketing, network events and meetups. All right, so these are, these are some reasonable ideas. Podcasts and online shows, ooh, podcast, all right. Uh, and then doing direct outreach and partnerships with career coaches and mentors. So, but, this, these tools have access to the internet, and so you can use them to ask specific questions targeted to particular things you're working on. So I'm gonna ask it about what organizations to partner with in Vermont. He can do this all day. <laughs> <laughs> It'll get tons of information. What? Go ahead, Joe. All right, so it's, it's suggesting some professional organizations. So what do we got here? We've got the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, the Vermont Center for Women and Enterprise, uh, Vermont Commission on Women, I think I saw their, they've got a table over here somewhere, I think, uh, and UVM, Champlain, CCV, oh, okay, well. <laughs> uh, all right, so it's come up with a bunch of ideas here. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna ask it is uh, about a particular uh, person and what they could speak on, and we're gonna see if this worked. It worked really well last night, so we're gonna okay, try this. All right. Okay. I'm going to say we have to train it to... Uh... <laughs> I use this heavily in picking on them, so we're all good. <laughs> okay. You're going to have to pronounce my last name. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so, so the prompt was... I'm thinking about asking Denise Shakurjan to speak at this conference. Yeah. And what would be some good sessions that she could present on basing, based on her experience? So you'll have to tell me if these are good sessions. All right, go for it. All right. So the first one is harnessing creativity and entrepreneurship. And it's because of your book, That's Uncommon right. Genius. That's right. Okay. Which explores the creative That's process. That's the writer. Yeah. All right. That's a plug from Josiah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've also got navigating career transitions with confidence. Okay, I'll it take says that you're good at that because of your background in law and storytelling. Oh, and you well. can offer practical advice. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's got another one about storytelling, storytelling in right. business. Storytelling, storytelling, right. also known as lying. All right, how about, how about this? <laughs> Legal insights for entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll take it. All right, all right. Yeah. Uh, overcoming obstacles. There's a whole bunch of them. Oh, here. boy, that's life. All okay. right. <laughs> That fits everybody. <laughs> oh, it even says you could do a panel discussion in a Q&A session. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. You believe Josiah or this machine, I got a bridge to sell you, but nonetheless, I think, I think it's a very good, good demo. I think we know what we're talking about. All right, so um, 
let's, let's now get into some other questions here. Um, let's start by looking at it in different sectors. Okay, you guys. Uh, how do you see generative AI being used in various industry sectors? Uh, personally, it's across the board, or it could be, but what are you seeing and what do you wish you're seeing there? Monique, you wanna okay. give a shot at this? Uh, sure, uh, I'm sure we're all gonna have a long list, so uh, just a few that I can think of, even just in my own personal use or classes I've taught, things like that. Um, so one is definitely like photo editing, so I don't know how many people here were getting like marketing or things like that, but uh, the number of times where I take a photo or I need to edit a head headshot or something for a panel bio or something, um, and being able to like fill in certain things, um, for instance, uh, I had a headshot that I needed to include for a webinar, and the only headshot I could find of the person online, their, the top of their head was cut off. Um, and actually, surprisingly, I like, expanded the canvas and asked it to fill in the top of their head. It actually did a really <laughs> great job. Um, I don't know if they wanted to be fed to AI and had it trained on their face, uh, so that is an ethical question. Um, but uh, that's an that's example. That's um, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'll just we'll yeah. share. Keep sharing. Yeah, I would say um, it feels pretty ubiquitous at this point, but it's, uh, there's a lot of noise. And so the thing I've been thinking a lot about, especially in applications of AI and government for like augmenting decision making or taking in, in healthcare, another big space, like taking large amounts of information and trying to look for patterns in it, um, is trying to discern what is actually new and what isn't. And I think one of the challenges right now is that it's using the word AI in anything you're doing is a really effective marketing tool. And so um, it's in some cases, I think there's sectors and technologies that have been using this stuff for a long time and are now, it's front and center for all of us. Um, but the, the applications that I think are the most exciting from my perspective are these, there's just like in healthcare and in government, large volumes of written information and trying to make decisions and trying to serve people well requires a lot of manual effort and I think there's a lot of opportunity there to take that information and look for patterns. I, I don't think we're yet at the point where they should, it should be making decisions um, and would probably, you know, I'm skeptic of it ever making decisions, especially when people's lives are at stake, but I think discerning patterns in large volumes of written or, or statistical information is really powerful. Yeah, building on what Cass was talking about, within Vermont state government, we're talking about AI as a power tool for information workers. And that idea of power tool, I think, is really helpful because um, when someone is using a power tool, they're using a tool they know how to use to do a particular task that the tool is good at. Um, and so when we think about it that way, it takes out a lot of the risk of, you know, is, is a robot making a decision, uh, a potentially regrettable decision? Uh, and it's really, it's a person who's still uh, using the tool to accomplish whatever it was they were working on. So I think within state government, we're using it in quite a few places, mostly kind of like I just showed you, uh, generating documentation. Uh, one of my favorite prompts is like, take a bunch of uh, jargon filled policy language from like, I don't know, agency of education or something and drop it in and Whoa, be like, careful. sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, they didn't have a booth here, so I'm gonna pick on Btrans because yeah, they do. Deep in, the, deep, deep in that education <laughs> sector here, I've got a reputation I got uphold here. <laughs> so, so I'll take that and I'll say, hey, make this into plain language. Right, which is a, a standard for how to communicate, and it'll it'll do it. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, is this does this say the same thing? And you know, you run that by some subject matter experts, and they can validate it. That's but just doing. like helping us who are either wonks or nerds, because that's who I'm mostly working with, <laughs> uh, to kind of get out of our frame and uh, and think about things from a different perspective. Like it's really useful for that. Um, I guess one other spot, you know, I'm in IT. One other spot we use it a lot is we, ha we have um, some code quality checking tools that are like, hey, uh, you know, this is potentially gonna have a bug, this is wrong, you know, in some way. And we actually feed those errors into a generative AI tool and it spits back out, hey, here's some suggested improvements, we give that back to the developer, and we find that it really improves the quality of the output. It's not changing things structurally, but it's like, oh, that dumb little mistake, uh, all of a sudden is now cleaned, uh, and that's great. I am not a tech person at all. Um, I, what I know about math wouldn't fill a symbol. But I, I can tell you that behind all of this is a lot of math. And in the old, and I have a kid in this world, and in the old days, the coding was so tedious. There was a lot of, uh, what did they call that? Um, team uh, coding, peered coding? You, you, you had to double team it just to get it right. 
Now you have this exquisite tool that will just jump right on it. Um, and it just saves a tremendous amount of time and catches all kinds of errors. And on the ed education side, which is an area I never thought I'd find myself in, my um, new nonprofit is involved in the mission of trying to spread AI literacy statewide. That's what our aim is. We all feel very strongly about it. Um, we did a listening tour first, what does Vermont need? Ultimately it came down to teachers as having the most impact. Teachers teach the kids, the kids go home and teach the parents, the parents are now in the community. The, the fallout from the, the endless possibilities from that chain of knowledge, um, I could spend the rest of this time talking about. But as far as my own question goes, in terms of the sector, as a teacher, you think about it. You, um, you're trying to teach a lesson, you've got a whole range of kids in your room, a whole range of abilities with this tool, which is inexhaustible, available 24-7, and free, you have uh, the opportunity for your students to learn at this level. They call it laddering. I think it's a wonderful word. Um, you, you have a kid, let's say, um, I had a conversation with somebody from Middlebury who was talking about the difficulty he, he had bringing students in because the pandemic had set them back and they weren't... Um, as knowledgeable as they might be, some of the kids coming from the less resourced areas knew nothing about calculus. This is how it worked. He would put a calculus question in and say, tell it to me on the level of a fifth grader. And the machine comes right back and tells it on a fifth grader. Tell it to me as a sixth grader. Put it to me in two sentences. Let's bring it all the way up now to collegiate level. Give me a problem set. Where am I consistently making mistakes? And that is really closing the gap on uh, the ability to learn. So. That's that. Um, personal stories, folks. On the, what, where have you seen it working, not working? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Um, okay. I have two. One exciting story and one cautionary tale. It's a little silly, but um, so I have a colleague who, who a very close friend of his, got diagnosed with breast cancer. This is not the silly story, obviously. Um, got diagnosed with breast cancer and was navigating, obviously, a very difficult diagnosis, trying to go to a bunch of different doctors, getting lots of different opinions, trying to make sense of like what was the right next step. And so he built her a personal GPT, which is a, a possible thing you can do. You can kind of build a, a, an instance and prompt it with a personality. And so he like prompted it to be like a friendly, like medical coach for her, basically. And she could upload her medical information, not, not personally identifiable information. So there's nothing particular to her going in, but notes from her different doctor's appointments. Um, and it was able to look across these things and say, here's where your doctors are agreeing. Here's where they're not agreeing. And then before she would go to a medical appointment, she could say, like, what question should I be asking my doctor? I'm about to meet my general practitioner. And it was just her feeling of empowerment in such a very difficult time was really incredible and just that having that at her fingertips felt really transformative. Um, the second story I'll tell is, is the sillier one, which this is maybe about a year ago now, um, was, uh, had a, was arranging a funder dinner, a philanthropic dinner, um, you know, or a nonprofit trying to raise dollars. And one of the folks on my team um, had the task of creating, printing out bios for everybody. And so went out uh, to the internet, collected bios, put them into ChatGPT, asked ChatGPT to make them more concise, and delivered them to the dinner, and folks started looking at them, and they were all wrong. Oh. It just made up bios for people that were wrong. Um, so it was nice that we were in a group of friendly people, and it kind of became a joke at dinner. Um, but it was a, a, just a cautionary tale. I mean, it's, the technology is obviously getting better every day. But like, you can put stuff in it, but you have to double check what it's saying um, and cannot just take whatever it's saying and say, I'm gonna run with this thing. Um, because yeah, it made up whole different experiences and they were heads of companies, things that like didn't exist at all. Um, so uh, comical, uh, but a little stressful at the moment yeah, at dinner. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, I try to not put uh, stuff into it uh, that I'm, like, um, we've uh, shared uh, that potentially could have a bunch of errors or have uh, ramifications that are dangerous and things like that. So, um, but when it comes to, I've done uh, kind of like marketing, like business, social media marketing 101 stuff or something with community members or uh, like town commissions, just like basic use of like social media um, networks, um, but then also like, the most, I feel like people are the most overwhelmed with like, okay, but I don't know how to, I don't have time to create content. I don't know how to like add a spin to this or I don't know which emojis to use or like whatever it is. So um, I like taking like, uh, for instance, uh, our local parks and rec department. It was, it's non-staffed, it's just volunteers. Um, and so they had already kind of put an outline of a skate park project onto the town website that they wanted to work on. So they already had like basic outline bullets of, of what they were doing, um, but they needed to come up with like appeal letters for fundraising and they needed to come up with social media like um, captions for photos of the, the half pipe they were building. Um, they needed to come up with example uh, responses or, or research areas for grant requests and things like that. Um, so we started taking, I would just copy and pasted all of the stuff from the town website uh, that they had done in bullets. They'd taken hours to like put that together. Um, and then I helped them as a group load it into ChatGPT and, and just walked through like prompts. Um, so it was like, I need to write an appeal letter to such and such foundation, asking them for such and such money, and uh, here's, the, here's all the stuff we're working on, and here's how it benefits kids, and we're like, help me write an appeal letter. Um, so that kind of stuff, like concrete, and just having them watch, as we've been watching, uh, the lines generate on the screen, they all just were like, oh my god, <laughs> like, this is this save us so much time. Um, and obviously it's something they need to go through that letter and they need to make sure that it's accurate and things like that, but it's even just just giving them, and I do this for myself, but even just like giving them an option of what to run with. Um, and like, I, I don't think I have ever taken anything from uh, ChatGPT or anything that I didn't have to like severely edit. Um, but it's like, it gives enough of a like, get me out of my stuck points. Um, and that's like where a lot of them are. Um, and we took that same thing, we're like, okay, turn this appeal letter into a caption for, for Instagram with such and such uh, number of characters uh, for whatever the limit is, and then add a bunch of emojis and like make it exciting. And, um, and so, and here's the image that it needs to correlate with um, and put that on. And so like then put that in there and like, oh my God, <laughs> uh, again, like there, um, so just like, being able to, I think, get the get um, you know people out of their heads of the overwhelm of like I can't do this, I don't know how to do it, I'm not a marketer, I'm just a volunteer, just a mom, I'm just like you know whatever it is. Um, so I think the empowerment of even being able to just see a concrete example of something in real life um, so as even a starting point, um, especially when people have um, lack of time and things, is just really powerful. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think a start is a really good point. Uh, do you have one, Joseph? I have one. Oh, you have one? Go ahead. Have right. Yeah, please. Um, so, uh, one of the things that we do a lot of uh, in state government is we write reports. So, uh, about eight months ago, I was working with our project management office, and uh, every year they produce roughly a 100-page report on all the IT projects that are going on across the state. Wow. And, uh, and it takes a long time. Uh, it takes a long time for both the director and, and all her staff to pull that together. And so I was like, I've got an idea try using ChatGPT for it. We hooked up a version that was connected to their project management software, so it had like all the status reports and everything. It could be like, all right, vroom, here's, here's a one-page summary of what that project has accomplished this year. And um, I was like, well, this will be great. This will save them all kinds of time. And uh, I talked to Stacy after, and I was like, how much time did it save you? And she said, several hours. And I went, several hours on a 100-page report? <laughs> Uh, but she went on to tell me that what had happened um, was that for the first time it was readable by someone who didn't, who wasn't an expert in both tech and whatever the business domain was that the project was for. So you didn't have to know details about DCF and tech in order to understand what that report said. And we're finding that in more and more places as we roll out the tool. We're not getting like crazy amounts of time savings, but what we are getting is much higher quality work. And our staff are like, this is this is the work I always wanted to do and never had enough time to get it to this level. And now I can. Um, and I think that's really exciting. Totally exciting. Um, I have a quickie from my writing life. Uh, I take a lot of notes and uh, my notes are, uh, I think it's uh, the, the most charitable description is hectic. 
And I, um, I had a quote that I needed. Uh, it was uh, buried in there and I wanted to use it. I didn't apparently write down the source. I thought, okay, I can't use it. Um, I threw it in Google and said, talk to me about this quote. Where's it from? Google was hopeless, had no interest whatsoever in helping me. Google works very differently than these tools, right? These tool, tools, I'm, I'm gonna leave it to the technologists to get into that, but Google is a different kind of operation. These tools are different. So I put it into chat and said, where's this from? Boom, comes right back. I don't recognize it. I said, mm, I don't think so. Try again. It comes back. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which is where people get confused. It's a machine, folks. That's all it is. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's from Ladida's source. Now I don't trust it, right? So I say, okay, give me the whole context. Gives me the whole context. What book? Gives me the context. What page? Gives me the context. I go to my own shelf, pull down the book exactly right. I would never have found that quote. Never in a thousand years. So there's that. Okay. Um, I could, there are a million stories and they're all cool, but uh, let's move on, if you guys don't mind, to um, look more carefully at the policies and practices. We, we know we've touched on some of the negative effects here. All of us have had that experience and know of people who've had that experience. So what kinds of policies and practices are we gonna wrap around this to mitigate against um, it making mistakes? <laughs> I'll take that one. I think um, you will, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's so much here and, uh, and it all starts on, again, data privacy. <laughs> um, so we are, all of these tools are mining as much data as they can to train on and to be able to predict uh, outcomes and things like that. So um, the areas that I'm hoping that we're focusing on um, are one, automated decision making. So AI tools are being used um, and have been used for years for things like whether or not you should be able to get a loan, um, whether or not you should be able to get a job, whether or not you should be fired because you, um, you know, when it comes to employee monitoring, things like that, like some companies monitor whether or not your eyes are moving up and down a screen, whether or not you're in your chair physically at, time, at moments of the day, um, and then it will, you know, in some cases, um, there's actually a really creepy New York Times article where you, as you read it, it grades how fast you read it and whether or not you comprehended it based on where your retina was going. Uh, it's really creepy. Um, but so then if you mix that with AI, then you have uh, monitoring that's feeding something data and then it's making an automated decision about whether or not you should be fired because you weren't in your chair for seven and a half hours of the day, like stuff like that. So um, when it comes to um, making automate, having machines, um, you know, collect data that in, in cases of like those articles, um, people just went to the bathroom. <laughs> like, are you allowed to go to the bathroom? Does the machine think that's an eligible like, use of your time? Um, when it comes to the generative platforms, like what are, a lot of um, companies are creating open source solutions. So they're you know, creating and designing a whole system. It could be automated cars, for instance. Um, and then uh, they might uh, sell that solution to other car companies to have like robotic taxi services, for instance. And this is a real example from a lobbyist call I had from a certain car company uh, that has electric cars. Um, <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, as far as that, those generative things is like the company, depending on how the company built the model, it could have um, ethical issues, it could have bias, it could have discrimination. Um, you don't know where they trained on that data, and then you also don't know if they have a severe bug based in the, like, the basis of their code that they are then perpetuating to the other companies that are buying this. So there's lots of ramifications if we do not put guardrails in place on automation and generative uh, systems. And just in general, I think the ethical and philosophical, like, what are we, what, what do we appreciate as human beings that makes us human that's different than machines and <laughs> codes that we are now asking to take over portions of our lives um, and like where do we want the line to be drawn um, and so there's lots of endless policy <laughs> decisions to be made there. I'll just quickly um, say the thing I, I think a lot about is how important the diversity of the people building the tools is and um, I think from a workforce lens we need um, 
we need diverse communities being trained in technology and joining companies and helping to build and monitor these tools or they're gonna come out the other side with a lot of the biases that we're seeing. And these technologies, like our society, obviously we all know, um, has a lot of bias, it is not equal. These technologies will continue to exacerbate those things if we don't have a diverse group of people at the table building these technologies. So we need these, um, we need employment and training programs, we need companies prioritizing diversity in their hiring, and that's something that we're trying to work a lot on that I think complements the, the policy pieces. That's a really good point. Is there a demo here, Josiah? Oh, no, no. Okay, so uh, before I dive into the demo though, I wanted to, to mention one other thing that you, you all can do in the places where you work, which is establishing some norms around how people work with machines. And thinking about uh, one of the policies that we put out basically said, it's never okay to blame the robot for something that didn't work. Uh, you know, you're the one driving, it's a power tool that you're using and so you're responsible for what gets produced. And I think developing some norms around that and that, that power tool mindset, I think alleviates a lot of the things that Monique was just talking about, where you know, if, we, if we have fully autonomous decisions being made, that's kind of much riskier than if we have a person um, using a power tool. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, to build on was what Cass was just talking about. Um, so this is, um, this was a, a quick demo that someone pulled together of how bias pops up in unexpected places um, in image generation. And so uh, she had made this picture of uh, back in the 80s of a kid riding a tricycle um, in front, you know, you can kind of see what that is. Uh, so she fed that into, I think it was a stable diffusion and said, all right, make me some variations of this image. And so it made some, but what stood out to her was that Unlike the kid in her original picture, none of these kids are black. These are the, all the kids turned into white kids riding a tricycle in front of a white picket fence. And so she said, all right, it's supposed to be a black kid. I don't know if you can see, and I'll scroll back up so you can see it. Uh, the trees all change. There's graffiti on the fence in this one, right? The buildings, my, I showed my wife this this morning and she's like, it looks like it looks like the more rundown parts of Baltimore. And I was like, yeah, that's what, that's what the AI model assumes. As soon as you say there's a black kid riding the tricycle, that you're in kind of a, a less affluent uh, area and, and kind of uh, much worse conditions overall. There are lots of examples of this. Um, I want to show one other one that I think is, is also telling. Uh, this one is uh, a Washington Post article from last year. They asked it to generate, um, they asked a tool to generate photos of someone playing soccer. And as you can see, these are mostly dark-skinned men playing soccer. And they also asked it to generate photos of someone cleaning, which are all happy white women uh, cleaning. <clears throat> and uh, I think that that's also you know, another spot where bias just pops out in these tools. And if, if you're not watching for it, it can be, you know, it, it, can, it can create um, a lot of issues. So, and, and as uh, Cass was just saying, right, the, the people who are noticing these things are not, uh, you know, the folks who are training the models. It's, it's people using the models and people who are like, oh, I want to do this thing, and then noting that there's, there's bias uh, popping up here all over the place. So um, some of this is work that we can do in regulation on, on training data sets. Some of it is just people continuing to write medium posts when they find stuff. And, and, and get the word out so that we can put better monitoring in place. And then the last one is, um, and NIST has done a bunch of work on this, how do you monitor the outputs of your AI systems to make sure the impact on the community is the one that you intended? Um, and so we're working on that a lot within state government right now, making sure that wherever we're using AI, we're making things better for everyone and not worse. Um, so, okay, I'll stop there. Oh gosh, there's just so much here, um, but I'm gonna force us to go on to the next uh, question because I think it's important, and it's this. Um, how do you think women, particularly those in the underrepresented fields, can leverage AI to enhance their careers and their economic opportunities? Anyone? Leveraging AI. 
Um, not, I'm not going to make any assumptions on all the sectors that everyone is representing here and just encourage, I think, um, one thing that I have found really beneficial is going on, and actually one area um, that's highlighted a lot of bias is going on to LinkedIn um, and just going to whatever your respective sector is and trying to like see who's like leading in that area. Um, I've like since learned through that, um, you know, uh, one the first article that was up there, um, like all of these authors, like there was, there's been uh, top 100 uh, most influential people in AI, and it was a group of just the entire list, which is like white dudes. Um, and so then, uh, following a bunch of LinkedIn people that were like getting really upset about that, including um, you know lists that had the author of that first article. So then it was like they created a hundred uh, women um, that had were influential in, in AI, and I just started following them. Um, and then when it got to the privacy legislation and AI legislation, I'm basically just like looking for hashtags with artificial intelligence or privacy. Um, and there's so many advocates and cool folks doing things. Um, and then there's also lots of like cool posts um, where people are sharing like uh, prompt engineering, as Denise had shared. Um, you know where people are saying like, hey, this is how you could. This is just like one example, one cool example about how you can um, design a prompt um, for such and such use. Um, and then often like reading the comments that'll lead to like other people with other ideas. So I just spend uh, a lot of time um, there trying to see who else is already in the field um, and following them and, and not being afraid to message them and being like, hey, that tool was awesome. Like, can you tell me more? Um, I feel like even outside of Vermont, like people are willing to, to help out in that. So just encourage that. Good tip. Yeah, yeah I would um, double down there that finding the right community is really important, finding voices that you trust and connecting with people across, uh, in person and across these platforms can be really powerful. Um, I think about, we've talked about a couple of these, but a couple of different categories of ways that it can help you in your job search or your job transition. There's the basics, which I think Josiah will demo, like applying to jobs takes a lot of time. And so resumes, cover letters, finding jobs, like all that stuff that can make your job search more efficient. Um, it also, like, as a working mom of three kids, it feels like there's never enough time, and so it can make the work that you are doing during the day more efficient and effective, as we've already kind of talked about, which can give you some extra time or headspace to think creatively about what really drives you and what you want to do next, and it's, it is really hard um, for women especially to capture that time. And then the third thing, I think, is really around this, um, this workforce diversity piece, which is like, we need more women, we need diverse voices, um, uh, in AI and in tech in general. And so I think there is this opportunity with some of these technologies to, to perhaps, I'm not 100% believing it yet, but to perhaps lay, level the playing field a little bit with access to knowledge and training that otherwise would be prohibitively expensive. Um, I think one of the challenges is that AI is moving, it's moving so fast that it's not like oh, I'm gonna go take this course on AI and then I'm good. There's like this need to continuously learn and continuously experiment. And so I think um, one of the pieces of advice is to like walk through whatever fear or apprehension you, one may have about experimenting with these tools or feeling like I'm not qualified to be in the room. Like even people who run these companies don't know enough about how these technologies work. So there's room for everyone in that room and what I think it takes is that um, openness, creativity, kind of getting past that wall of fear, um, and supporting each other so we can create pipelines into building and monitoring this technology to make sure it works better for folks on the other side. Um, just how you have any uh, yeah, I, on this? I think one other place to think about is uh, professional development, um, and uh, as Cass was just alluding to, but a lot of times, you know, as I'm reviewing resumes, what stands out is the thing that wasn't part of your job, but you did to make wherever you were working better, right? And, and some sort of project like that. And that is where these tools actually really shine, is empowering you to kind of uh, have an idea and then develop it and then get your foot in the door to go have a conversation about, okay, let's, let's roll this out. Let's make work better for everyone here. And um, I, I have a demo, but I know we're short on time. So I'll, we are I'll short on time, but the hold it. Like, right, yeah, I think you should show it. That's cool. Should do it. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, let me cut to the chase. There are no barriers to entry here. Let me repeat that. There are no barriers to entry here. This stuff is there. It's free. You can learn it. It'll teach you. Um, and and you give it, give it your goal and go for it. Yeah. Let's see this next okay. cool thing.
So as Cass was saying, uh, you know, I, this is a, a simple example of how you can prep a resume and, and use this tool to help with it. So I'm not actually going to give this my resume. I'm just going to give it my LinkedIn and tell it to make me a resume. We'll see how right it is. Anybody from beta here? From beta? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay, because okay, yeah. I'm going to pick on beta. So, okay. All right. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, beta is very quiet about their AIUs because they're trying to get licensed. Go yes. Ahead. Uh, yeah. So anyway, they've got this job that I'm like not qualified for, but it's engineering and software and I know something about that. So I'm going to say I want to apply for this job. So uh, here's the job. Thank you. All right, and it's going to go grab that. And okay, look at that. So it's making a resume, not even knowing anything about me. Look at this. I know about DO 178C, whatever that is. I know about all kinds of things. All right. Well, this is not very useful. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab my LinkedIn. I'm just going to grab, nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm trying it to grab all It takes you this. longer to brush your teeth than it does to redo your resume. <laughs> all right, so now I've given it my LinkedIn, which does not include my address, city, state, zip, email, phone number, any of that. But it has all this stuff, right? And it's like, oh, hey, this is maybe stuff that's potentially relevant. OK. And uh, it's not particularly relevant, though, still. So I'm going to give it one more prompt after it finishes spitting out content. So you're going over to beta, huh? <laughs> One of the things I love about this uh, is I sometimes find, especially when you're in a rush, it's so hard to stare at a blank page and write something. This kind of gets to what you were talking about. Just um, even if it's not exactly what you want it to be, just having something to edit is immensely more helpful than staring at a blank page. Uh, That's what happens when I go too fast. <laughs> Paste the wrong thing. Just a second. In the old days, you had to hire help, right? I can speak to the old days. You had secretaries, you had assistants, you had all kinds of interns. Today, when the computer came on, you're expected to do all of it now, and now you really can. So, okay, so what I just did was I told it, hey, I want to target the resume for that job, make my resume more story based, and highlight the accomplishments that might be relevant. So, okay, so it wrote up this nice professional summary. It actually got the years right. If you search me online, there's one AI-based source that will say I have 20 years of experience. Uh, but, um, okay, so it, it's come up with like different stuff that I've worked on and kind of given some stories in here. Like this is a pretty decent resume. But the last thing I'm gonna show here is that I actually don't know anything about this type of engineering. And I'm gonna tell ChatGPT that and ask it to come up with a training plan for me and a capstone project that will show something relevant. Other things that uh, Josiah could be asking it is, uh, I have an interview coming up with Beta. What's the hardest question they're going to ask me? What answer should I give? And it will, it will provide that. What qualities do I have that I should be sure to, to stress? What story should I tell to stress those qualities? Um, uh, what is the likelihood, statistically, of me getting this job? What is the greatest reason I won't get this job? What is the greatest reason they might give me this job? You can be so prepared now to make transitions, to get employment, to seek opportunity. Did you do it? Is it done? It's, it's still going. You it's keep still talking. going. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to have Josiah finish this demo, and um, then we're going to take some of your questions because I, I want to make sure you have that opportunity. We were going to get into a whole discussion of what side gigs you might want to take up <laughs> using this technology. But what I challenge you to do is go home, load this. It's free, folks, free, free. If I can load it, believe me, you can load it. And ask it, what side gigs could I use this technology for? And it'll give you the same answers we, we would give here. Actually, not quite the totally same one. And if you're still loading, I'll explain that for a second. You yeah, done? You can explain it. All right. I asked uh, somebody in the field, I said, what do you mean the people out at OpenAI or whatever say that they don't really know how this works? And, and he thought about it for a minute, and he said, it's like a kaleidoscope. When you lift that up and turn it, you don't exactly know how those pieces are going to come together. So if you think of it like that, every time you ask it something, it's going to be a little different. So keep asking. Go ahead. All right. So, so what I did here was I told it I'm not good at 
Like, I don't know anything about all these things, which I actually really don't know anything about. <laughs> and so it came up with a training plan. Is this a good training plan? I don't know. No one here works at Beta, so they can't tell me. But uh, <laughs> it's going to, you know, have me learn how to write in C, use uh, Hercules, microcontroller, all this stuff. Like, this seems reasonable, and it's got some practice exercises I can do. All right. But what I'd really like to do is pull it all together into a capstone project that's relevant to the aviation industry and low cost, something I can do at home. So that after I finish that training program, like what's something reasonable I can do that I could then tell the folks at Beta about and be like, yeah, see, I know what I'm doing. Uh, so it's suggested this low cost home flight data monitoring system. So basically building a microcontroller with a gyroscope and an altimeter in it that I could stick on a drone and it would give real time uh, data back and it's kind of roll like giving me a layout of like here's how you could probably approach this could I actually do this I don't know but this is at least a starting place mm -hmm. right I can go do research I can figure out if this is feasible and I can go learn these things will it take me a while yeah it'll probably take me quite a while because I don't know very much about this but uh, you know again getting off of that kind of blank slate getting yourself into a spot where you could you could take action on something and that's I think that's cool. I love it I love it um, we could go on forever as you no doubt gathered but I'd like to hear from some of you I'm sure you all have some questions um, yes lady in the frontier so I noticed one of the things that you were doing was you were doing real-time web browsing and that's a feature that I just was recently given access to without the paid version of chat GBT. I just asked if everyone has access to that now, and it gave me two conflicting answers. Is that a feature everyone gets now? Well, 3.5 um, was the original version, and it was free and still is free. Uh, then came 4.0, which uh, my kid said, 3.5 is, what do you say, uh, faster, 4.0 is smarter. And then came 4.0 as in the letter O, as in Omni, and that's a whole other world. And that is still free, I believe. No? Well, it was supposed to be. It's, it, there's, stick with 3.5. It's a three version, a free version. I pay 20 bucks a month for 4.0, and I know I get 4.0 with that, yeah. Uh, I don't have a mic anymore. Here you go. Yeah. So, so if you want to use that, the other there are lots of other tools beyond ChatGPT that right. have that. So if That's you use right. the one built into like the Bing browser, that has access to the internet all the time, and that one is actually free. I have been given access to it without paying for it, so I didn't know if that just yeah. the whole feature for it. So my experience was that they give you a limited number of turns a day for free, oh, and then right. and then they're like, oh hey, if you want to keep using it, it's just twenty bucks a month yeah. forever. Yeah. So I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that Vermont is home, as we all know, to an aging population that every day feels left behind with the current technology. How do you view this technology? My concern, deep concern, is that it will further create more of a digital divide and that they already feel left behind. How do you see this technology potentially further interrupting or potentially solving this? especially for our older Vermonters. Anyone want to take that? Or? I think this technology is going to be um, enormously impactful uh, to that population. What it takes is education. I just had this conversation with someone. It's education. That's why we're here today. That's why I set up this nonprofit. That's why I'm going to be in front of a bunch of teachers. When you realize what's here, and if you have the courage to just try it, just go play, I think, uh, I think that population is going to have a great time. Also, as to the aging population, learning these skills in the younger generations is going to help turn Vermont into a place that the kids want to stay. There's much more that could be said about that related to the tech hub or whatever, but it, it's going to have a double effect of creating some equity, bringing, bringing age differences um, into account, and uh, creating a pipeline for the tech jobs that are coming. We haven't even talked today at all about how the jobs are changing. It's a whole other area, but we can't do it all today. Um, we need three days. Yeah. Um, I would, my general feeling on this is that um, because the technology is moving so fast, it's going to exacerbate, to your point, underlying inequities that already exist. So it creates additional urgency to address the things that we all know are problems that this technology may, will exacerbate. 
whether that's bias, inequity, digital divide, those sorts of things. I think it is encouraging that a lot of these tools are free, um, but if you don't feel comfortable using them, um, you know, it, it's, it doesn't really help. Um, so that's, that's the, the big thing that I think we really need to focus on. That's where your libraries come in. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. One other thought that I'll, I'll mention is we need to think about experiences, especially within government, think about experiences that people are having when they're interacting with these new tools. So imagine that we roll out a chat bot that frees up a bunch of call center agents uh, to spend less time talking to young folks, but let's keep those folks around so that the older folks who are more comfortable calling in on the phone can still get to a human and can get to that human with less wait time, mm -hmm. right? So there's opportunities to use AI for people who want to adopt it and to make channels that work better for people who are familiar with that and use that to provide better service to more more vulnerable folks. Yeah. Oh, I forgot, sorry, one other thing, a point I wanted to make that you made me think about. Um, I think the other dimension to this is discernment and helping, and this is, across the whole population, I think this is for young people and aging populations, that one of the biggest things in digital literacy now is gonna be discerning fact from fiction, and that's gonna get increasingly challenging, and so I think this is also a new dimension of things that we're gonna to have to think about um, in our communities. Can I take a present? Please. Uh, please reach out to your legislators and tell them that you're concerned about digital technologies. <laughs> we're 20 years in the very least behind. A lot of people still don't have broadband, don't have access to a computer, um, so we are way behind. Please complain. <laughs> <laughs> you, need, you need that. You definitely need that. We have time for one more question. Um, I'm, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I have a question around a race uh, child and around the ethics. Uh, he's going to be applying to colleges. He comes from a Waldorf non-technology background. And I would hate to see him plug his things out and go, here's my essay, obviously. So ethics on the um, use when to, when not to. Any thoughts? Well, yeah, I have a lot of opinion on that. Um, I think if I were doing that, and, and I think if I were doing that, uh, trying to raise a kid who was preparing the college um, essays, uh, I might use the tool, or have that person use the tool to generate some ideas, to generate some language, and to um, kick it off. Um, there's an enormous difference between what a machine writes and what a human writes. As a writer, I'm here to tell you, it'll be en enormously obvious when a machine creates something as compared to a human, and it will also be soon technically obvious because there's other products coming along, like uh, the equivalent of a watermark where the, the person will know that. What I'm seeing happening in, in the schools, which I think is really smart, is um, they have these generated essays and then have the kids pick them apart and discuss why they're not as good as they might be or what the lost opportunities were. So I guess I would use it as a teaching um, opportunity. Um, for provoking more thought, for provoking better thought. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I really thank you all for your attention. I'm, I'm so impressed with uh, my colleagues here. I, I've asked them to share with you one last parting thing that you might want to know um, as you enter and go on and consider your careers and maybe your transitions and your AI journey, which is inevitable, by the way. Go ahead, anybody. Yeah, so one of the things that we're thinking about um, is previous technological things that have rolled out. Um, have disproportionately impacted women in the workforce. So thinking about things like switchboard operator, which is a job that like doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there was a movie and book Hidden Figures that talked about you know technology initially being an opportunity for women and then becoming kind of a thing that they got pushed out of. And so one of the things that we need to work on as a society is designing our future around AI in ways that are more like what we've been talking about here today, right? Where it's an opportunity, where it's empowering, where there's um, you know, it, it's making things better for everyone. Um, and so, you know, that's something that's still being worked on, but it's a conversation that's, that's happening. And, and uh, Monique said, write to your legislator, like, just like talk about that, like keep awareness going in that space, because I think that's somewhere we can do better. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Um, the first thing I would say is it's easy to fear what you don't know. And so um, being willing to experiment and play around with things 
can help demystify and take some of the fear around, um, you know, this could take my job or I don't know how to do this, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing is that uh, there's a lot of fear mongering happening right now around AI and some of it is legitimate and some of it is not. And I think we live in a society right now um, with a lot of clickbait and where news outlets are trying to say things, like the most inflammatory voices end up being the loudest and amp being amplified the most. And so you're gonna hear people say that AI is going to destroy society. You're gonna hear people say that it's gonna fix every problem. And neither of those things are right, but they're what you're gonna hear the most of. And so just finding those communities, news sources you trust, doing your own experimentation and trying to just kind of take a deep breath and let all the noise happen and try not to get so caught up in it, I think is uh, good words of advice for all of us. Another good piece of advice. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it could be as easy as um, like putting into Google, um, I don't know anything about artificial intelligence, where should I start? <laughs> um, so, I mean, for myself, like I am, you know, go on to like Coursera or YouTube or anything like that and just start like going down kind of a rabbit hole of like something looks interesting to me and then I'll go on the next thing. But I'm spending a lot of time just like watching videos uh, to catch myself up because there's so much. Um, but find a thing that you're actually really interested in and maybe dig a little bit further um, through a lot of free tools just by, I, I hate like boosting up Google, but by doing an internet search. All of that's good advice. And you know what I'm gonna say because you've heard me mouthing off here. Um, get curious, um, bring your skeptical mind, um, play with these tools. Uh, what I would like to see is um, that first step forward, I'd like to see women, in particular, learn to leverage these things toward the goals that matter to you and your families and the community, toward the positive. And um, that's actually, a, that's what I believe and that's what I'm working for in these next few years. So thank you all for your attention. We appreciate it. Thank you panelists for your time. And um, we'll see you at the next one. Huh? Dear, I turned it on. Thank off. you. Well, 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 yeah, that's turned okay. It off. That's yeah. okay. We'll turn it right back on. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Hello. Yes. Hello. Me Hello. Too. There you Hello. Go. Okay. Thank you all so much for attending. Thank you to Orca Media for live streaming much of this event, um, a couple of the workshops as well. So that link will be made available. Um, we will also be sending you a link for an evaluation. So we would appreciate um, some feedback for next time, so thank you for filling that out in advance. And um, now we're gonna draw a couple names, so get up your tickets. Or not names, numbers, okay. The first ends with, the first ends with 633. Oh, good, yeah. Yeah. Thank you.